got a good crowd coming in, so why don't we get started and I'll begin. Uh, my name is Anna Withers. I'm the Farmer Outreach Coordinator for Springfield Community Gardens, and we are a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And this workshop on seed storage, management, treatment is generously sponsored by the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program from the USDA and the Missouri Department of Agriculture. Our speaker tonight is the University of Missouri MU Extension Horticulture Field Specialist, Patrick Byers, and I will let him introduce himself further in a moment, but just some housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions throughout the night, please ask as we go. You can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question there during the presentation, and we'll stop periodically to answer those. Uh, there's also a chat feature at the bottom of your screen, so please only use this for comments, and that will help me keep track of questions and making sure that I've answered it. We've gotten everything answered throughout the night. And then also, if you don't mind, once you leave this workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post-workshop survey, and that survey is used in SCG's reporting to the USDA, and it also helps us provide meaningful workshops for you in the future. So we'd really appreciate it if you could just take a few moments and fill that out after the workshop. If you'd like to view this recording later, it will be available on uh, Springfield Community Gardens Agriculture Workshop playlist on YouTube. And I will put that link as well as our website, social media and tonight's exit survey into the chat in just a few moments. So without further ado, I will hand it off to Patrick. Thank you, Anna. Well, it is a pleasure to be with you here this evening. And I'm a lifelong gardener. And one of my favorite things is to take a seed, plant it, and then step back and watch it grow to the point where I can have an abundant harvest of whatever it is that I'm growing. And I hope that you share my interest as well. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to talk about seeds. And this is the second in a series of workshops on propagation practices. Um, earlier, we talked about propagating fruit crops. Tonight, we're going to start our discussion of vegetables and seed propagated plants. And this first workshop is going to focus on seeds and seed management and seed treatment. So let's go ahead and bring up the presentation. <clears throat> okay, Anna, can we see the presentation? Yep, it looks good. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, as Anna mentioned, I am with University of Missouri Extension, and I'm with a, a, a horticulture field specialist based in Webster County, which is one county to the east of the Springfield Green County metro area. And I've been with Extension for about 14 years, and prior to that, I worked at the Missouri State Fruit Experiment Station for, uh, for 18 years. And also, in, in the midst of all that, I, I'm a farmer. I have a farm uh, near Fordland, Missouri. And Previously grew peaches, and here you can see uh, uh, me in, uh, a few years ago, a bit younger then, uh, with a wonderful basket of peaches from my orchard. In more recent times, I've transitioned to a new farm and, and a new crop. I'm growing elderberries now. Um, tonight, we'll be focusing on seed propagated crops on, on primarily vegetables, but there's some fruits that are seed propagated as well. And as I said before, this is the first in a series. We'll be delving into a, a number of other interesting topics that surround the propagation of plants, things such as uh, propagation structures and, and uh, sowing and uh, transplant production, you know, some of these uh, interesting topics in, in the uh, weeks ahead. So stay with us for this uh, series of workshops. The workshop is a partnership with Springfield Community Gardens. Um, uh, as uh, Anna mentioned, Springfield Community Gardens is a nonprofit grassroots organization it has the vision of a community where everyone has access to healthy local foods. And Springfield Community Gardens uh, oversees a network of community gardens across the uh, Springfield Green County area, and also oversees a very innovative small farm development program. And so if you're on the call tonight and you have an interest in, in farming, especially if you're thinking about getting started in farming, reach out to Springfield Community Gardens. We have a number of resources and programs that I think will be of benefit. And then the third partner, of course, is the USDA. And the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, has programs for farmers of all scales, including small scale specialty crop farmers. And I encourage you to visit the farmers.gov website 
where there is a collection of resources for, for uh, specialty crop farmers. Two agencies in particular, the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Risk Management Agency have programs that I think will interest those who are on the call that are, are farming or considering farming. Well, this is what I'd like to do tonight. And um, again, this is the first in, in a series of seed related workshops. So we're going to have a brief introduction to seed propagation tonight. Then we'll talk about saving seed. Now we've done entire workshops on just this topic on saving seed. In fact, we have a recording on saving seed on the uh, uh, YouTube channel that, that Anna mentioned. And I've excerpted a couple of short videos from that workshop to, uh, to talk about saving seed. And then we'll talk about other ways of obtaining seed, purchasing and, and otherwise obtaining seed. And then we'll move into to handling seed. We'll talk about how to store seed. And we'll also talk about seed viability, how long seed will last as far as uh, uh, being able to store it. Then we'll talk about uh, managing seeds from the standpoint of seed-borne diseases. There are several diseases that can actually be spread and brought into a farm on the seed. So it's important to understand uh, these, these pathogens and how we can manage those. And then finally, we'll, we'll discuss a number of different seed treatments, uh, different ways that seeds are treated during the, uh, the uh, uh, point of, of seed management before you plant. So this is our, our outline for tonight. Uh, as Anna mentioned, if you have any questions at any time, please put them into the Q&A and I'll stop periodically and, and we'll tackle any questions that might be there. So again, I encourage you to reach out and, and share your interests with me. So what is seed propagation? Well, seed propagation is analogous to sexual propagation. There is a uniting of gametes from a male and female parent in the process of seed propagation. And this uniting of gametes results in fertilization. Once we have fertilization, we now have the, uh, the basis of a viable seed. And if the process continues, the result will be the development of a seed. And uh, a seed is an amazing thing. Looking at that handful of seeds there in the slide, uh, when I was young, it, it just seemed like um, a wonderful mystery to me where you could take something that was small and dry and appeared to, to not have life in it, plant it, and then within a few days, a new plant will appear. Again, it was just an amazing thing to me. And I've done a number of workshops with, with very young children, kindergarten age children. And uh, when, when I ask them what a seed is, I get interesting responses. But I, I particularly remember a response that I got a number of years ago from a, a kindergartner who said, a seed is a lot like a present. You know, you don't know what's inside of it till you open it up and see, but you know it's going to be pretty cool, whatever it is. And you know, that, that young person is right. I couldn't agree more. Now there's some advantages to seed propagation. Uh, when we compare this to, to uh, say asexual propagation through cuttings or grafting or division or, or layering, seed propagation is a much faster way to get plants. And it's also an economical way to get a lot of plants. We can take a handful of radish seed and have hundreds of, of radishes resulting from the, the exercise of planting that handful of radish seeds. And it's also easy to do. Again, the act of planting a seed is, is one of those basic uh, enjoyable tasks that, that uh, gardeners have, have before them. It's, it's just a fun, easy thing to do. Now, there are some disadvantages of seed propagation. If we're working with hybrid uh, vegetables, you know, for example, hybrid tomatoes, hybrid sweet corn, uh, whatever it might be, if it's a hybrid, Typically, hybrids do not breed true from, from seed. In other words, if we had a hybrid tomato that was a beautiful, large red slicer, and we thought, well, I'd like to have more plants just like that. Well, if we save the seeds from that beautiful red slicer and then plant them next year, the odds are that the resulting fruit on those plants will not be like the original big red slicer. It's just the nature of hybrids. They are genetically diverse, and uh, they just don't uh, reproduce true from seed. So again, um, with, with some types of, of vegetables, hybrids in particular, seed propagation is not practical. And then there are some plants that are difficult to propagate from seeds. And although it's not a vegetable, this picture is a picture of a pawpaw. And you can see those beautiful big seeds there in that pawpaw fruit. And uh, uh, you know, certainly you can plant those seeds, but if you don't handle them properly, they will never germinate. Pawpaw seeds have to be stratified with cool, moist conditions. And uh, if this isn't done properly, the seeds will just dry up and die. 
And then another interesting fact of, of pawpaw propagation is that these seeds may take two years to germinate. You can do everything right and plant them in pots or in the soil and, and nothing comes up the first spring. And you're thinking, my goodness, what's going on here? Well, don't give up, don't give up. Sometimes it takes two years before those seeds germinate and grow into pawpaw plants. Now, a, a bit of botany, a bit of botany and anatomy. So with uh, seed propagation, as I mentioned before, we have the contribution of a male and a female parent. Um, the uh, male and female parent may actually be the same plant, but we have male and female structures. And within the flower, the uh, male structures are called anthers, and anthers produce pollen. Now, from the standpoint of seed production, the important organ is the pistil, the female organ. And the pistil produces egg cells. And the uh, process of pollination, pollen moves from the male organ to the female organ, and then the pollen germinates, it grows down the pistil, it unites with the egg cells, and the result is a viable embryo. Now, those male and female reproductive organs, in many cases, they're in the same flower. And these flowers are called perfect flowers. Sometimes we have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. Um, I just recently uh, became very interested in chestnuts and growing chestnuts. And chestnuts are a good example of a tree where there are separate male and female flowers on the same tree. If you've grown chestnuts before, you know that they produce a long catkin that produces the pollen. And then also on the tree, there are these small uh, greenish, well, they, they look like, uh, you know, they're about the size of a large pea and they look a little rough. And those are the female flowers, which in time, will develop into the burrs that hold the, uh, the uh, chestnut nuts inside. So again, a case where we have different flowers on the same plant. And then sometimes we have separate male and female plants. Now this is a, a, a common situation with the vine crops. I'm sorry, not with the vine crops, with uh, certain fruits like persimmons, for example, and mulberries. We don't have very many vegetables where you have separate male and female plants, but uh, it, it is a, an interesting situation. And again, here is an example of a perfect flower. Now this is a lily and I chose this because it's very easy to see the floral parts. The anther is the part of the flower that produces the pollen, you know, the male cells. And then the pistil just below it there is the uh, female organ. And pollen moves from the anther to the pistil. The pollen germinates, it grows down the length of the pistil. And at the base of the flower is where the, uh, the union occurs between the the uh, pollen and the egg cells, which results in the formation of an embryo and eventually a seed. Now here's a nice example of a plant that has both male and female flowers. And this is a zucchini. And zucchini and, and actually many of the vine crops have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. If we look at the male flower, which we see there in the lower left, uh, all that this flower has in it is the, the, uh, the stamen, again, the, uh, the organ that produces the pollen. However, if we take a look at a female flower, first of all, we can tell from the outside it's female because you can see a rudimentary zucchini behind the flower. And if we look within the flower, we see a pistil. There's no stamens within this flower, just a pistil. Now, the interesting thing to think about is how is this, the pollen going to move from the stamen to the pistil? And with many of these plants that have separate male and female flowers, there's some agent that moves that pollen. You know, in the case of a chestnut, it's the wind. In the case of this zucchini, it's likely going to be a honeybee or a bumblebee. Now again, pollination is necessary before seeds will form. The pollen has to somehow move from the male organs to the female organs. Now there are some vegetables where this happens within the same flower. Beans, tomatoes, peppers, these are good examples. And then we just saw the, uh, the uh, zucchini. Zucchini and it, its other cucurbit relatives generally are insect pollinated where an insect will move the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. And then we have some vegetables that are actually wind pollinated. This is the case with spinach and corn. And again, just to take a look at these things, if we look at the lower picture, the lower right picture, this is a squash, and this actually is the female flower. And if you were to look closely at that honeybee, you would notice that honeybee has pollen clinging to its legs and its body. And when it visits this uh, female flower to, to uh, seek the nectar at the base of the flower, that pollen gets dusted off onto the female parts of the flower. And this is how pollination occurs. If we look at the upper picture, that's a tomato flower. And 
if you look at the, the center of the flower, you see that column rising from the flower. This is actually the, uh, the stamens and, are the, um, and they're united in a column around the pistil. And you'd have to look very carefully to see the pistil, but it is just extending at the very tip of that column of stamens. And so pollen has to move just a very short distance from the uh, stamens to the, uh, the uh, pistil on a tomato plant. And in fact, just the movement of the tomato plant in a breeze will accomplish pollination. And then once pollination occurs and we, we, uh, the result is an embryo, we have the development of a seed. And a seed has a number of different parts. I'm not going to go into detail here, but for our purposes, we wanna remember that a seed, first of all, contains the embryo, which will be in time a new plant, and it typically contains stored food steps. And these stored food steps are found in what are called the cotyledons. Some types of vegetables have two cotyledons in their seeds, and a classic example would be a bean whereas other vegetables have a single cotyledon. That's the case with a vegetable like corn, sweet corn. And when germination occurs, the embryo begins to grow. And in some cases, the cotyledons split apart, a root system begins to form, all of this nourished by the foodstuffs in the cotyledons. And then eventually in time, the uh, stem will extend above the soil, the uh, leaves will expand, and it will begin to photosynthesize and produce the foods that are needed to support the uh, plant for the rest of its life. And in time, the stored foods and the cotyledons will be exhausted, and then the plant relies on photosynthesis to provide its foodstuffs. Okay, so that is a quick introduction to, uh, to seed propagation. Now let's turn our attention to saving seed. And I'm an inveterate seed saver. I've been saving seeds since I was a boy, and it's one of, again, one of my, my favorite aspects of gardening, saving seeds. And you know, we, we save seeds for a number of reasons, but a really important reason is to save our gardening heritage. If we were to step back 120 years to around the year 1900, we would find a much greater diversity in types of vegetables available in our, in our gardens. And in, in more recent years, we've seen this diversity eroded. We've seen the loss of many vegetable varieties as they've been replaced by uh, uh, high yielding, uh, disease resistant hybrids. Now, for good reason, of course, it's uh, from the standpoint of commercial production, these high yielding uh, disease resistant hybrids are, are great. But if we grow only those, we're, we're, we're losing the, the other types that we had previously. So this is an important reason to save seeds. And of course, uh, heirloom varieties typically come true from seeds. So they're great candidates for seed saving. Now, uh, I've got a, a short video here and this video focuses on two different types of seed saving. First of all, seed saving from tomatoes. This is a good example of what we call wet processing. So those things like tomatoes or cantaloupes or cucumbers, we would use that method. And then the second method that we'll see is called dry processing. And this is where we're harvesting seeds from a plant that normally dries the seed naturally. In this case, we're using uh, uh, cilantro as, as our example. So let's take a quick look at this video. Okay, Anna, can we see the video at this point? Yep, we can. I'm Patrick Byers, horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Now, when saving seeds from vegetables or from other plants, there are different techniques that are used depending upon the characteristics of the type of seed you're saving. And a good example is tomatoes. And uh, here we have a couple of heirloom tomatoes. These are tomatoes that come true from seed. They're a good candidate for seed saving. But how do we extract the seed from a tomato? Well, we use a process called wet extraction. And let's walk through the steps of wet extraction. If you're interested in saving seeds from tomatoes, it's first important to let the tomato fruit ripen fully. And you can see our heirlooms here are ripe, and in fact, they're a little bit overripe. These are at the perfect stage for extracting the seed. Now let's take a quick look at tomato fruit anatomy. And we're gonna go ahead and cut this tomato fruit across the center here, and we'll take a look at the inside. We'll notice inside that there are areas that are solid, and there's areas that are filled with a liquid. And this area that, that's filled with the liquid, these, these voids, are full of what's called gel. 
and the gel actually contains the seeds, and we can see some seeds right here that are present. The solids, of course, don't contain seeds, and we're not really particularly interested in those from the standpoint of seed saving. What we're going to focus on is the liquid area, the gel and the seeds. Once we've cut the tomato fruit across, now we're going to separate the gel from the solids. And this is done very easily by squishing the tomato fruit. You can see how the gel and the seeds pop out. We'll work the tomato around like this, and then we can scrape the seeds and the gel into our bowl here. And again, notice that the seeds are only found in the, uh, in the, uh, the open areas, in the areas that are filled with the gel. You can always go in and cut individual uh, locules or, or voids open if we like. There's that one. Let's go ahead and extract the seeds from this piece here as well. Okay, and we'll continue this process until we have all of the uh, gel and the seeds extracted. And then here is our final tomato. Let's go ahead and cut it across. We'll squeeze the seeds and the gel out into our bowl. It's a little bit messy job. You want to make sure that you do it in an area where you can clean up after yourself. And you can see the seeds and the gel coming out of this out of this tomato fruit. Okay, now we've completed extracting the seeds and the gel from our tomatoes. We finished extracting the gel and the seeds from the heirloom tomatoes. Now we have all of this material in a bowl. The next step is to allow this mixture to ferment. We'll take the bowl, we'll place it in a warm area out of direct light, and we'll leave it open and fermentation will take place over three or four days. We'll know the process is underway when we see a thick white layer of mold on top of the, uh, the mixture of seeds and gel. The fermentation process helps break down naturally occurring germination inhibitors that are found in tomato seeds, and it also helps eliminate some of the seed-borne diseases that may be present on the seed that we've collected. The, the mixture of the gel and the tomato seeds will ferment after several days. It'll first develop a nice white layer of mold on top, and then it'll eventually look like the, the uh, bowl of seeds and pulp that we see here. At this point, the solids have been pretty much disintegrated, and it's time to strain the seeds out. It's been several days since we extracted the seeds and the pulp from our tomatoes. The mixture has fermented, and now it's time to separate the seeds. This is a wet extraction, and we'll be working with the fermented mixture of the tomato seeds and the tomato solids. The fermentation process has broken down the solids. Now it's time to separate the seeds. I like to use a bucket of water and a sieve, and we'll take our um, seed and pulp fermented mixture here, and we'll pour it into the sieve. Keep in mind that when we were fermenting the mixture, there was no added water. It's just the juice, the uh, pulp, and the tomato seeds. But at this point, we're going to use water to help separate the solids from the seeds. We're working all of the, uh, the remaining solids through the uh, sieve. It can also be helpful to do this in a sink where you have, can direct a stream of water through the mixture as well. Well, we're at a point now where we pretty much have separated all of the solids from the seeds. You can see that what we have remaining in our sieve is the tomato seeds. I'll do a final rinse. And then now it's time to lay the seeds out on a piece of absorbent paper and allow them to air dry. Here are our tomato seeds. 
Once the tomato seed is dry, and typically this takes two to three days, it's ready for storage. Place the seed into a container where it can be sealed and kept dry. Good containers include things such as plastic Ziploc type bags, plastic food storage containers, used pill bottles, or perhaps mason jars with sealed lids. And then once the uh, seed is in the container, make sure that you label the container so that you can remember, first of all, the vegetable, the cultivar if known, and very importantly, the year that you collected the seed. And then store the seed under refrigeration for shorter term storage in the refrigerator for longer term storage in the freezer. Your tomato seed should remain viable for several years after collection. <laughs> Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. One of my favorite parts of gardening is saving seeds. I love the idea of saving seeds from year to year to year. And, and why not? It's a great way to save a bit of money on the cost of seed, but more importantly, it's a fantastic way to help preserve our gardening heritage. Cilantro or coriander is a good example of a garden vegetable where the seed is dry processed. The uh, plant is allowed to mature, the seed is allowed to dry on the plant, and then the uh, seed is gathered, the uh, chaff is removed by winnowing, and then the seed is put up for storage. With dry processed vegetables such as coriander, where the seed is allowed to dry and then it's harvested, winnowed, and put up for storage, it's very important to harvest the seed at the right stage of maturity. This first bun bunch of cilantro, the uh, seed is still green. It's not completely mature. If we were to harvest this, it would dry, but it's likely that the embryos within the seed would not be viable. Here is an example of a cilantro seed head where the seed is approaching maturity. This would be a good stage at which to harvest. The seed is beginning to dry down, but yet it's not dried to the point where it's shattered or lost from the seed head. This third bunch has gone too far. It's been allowed to dry too long on the plant. The seeds are beginning to shatter we need to harvest this right away before any more seed is lost. With dry harvested seeds, sometimes the plants don't dry down uniformly. If we look at our bed of cilantro here, there are some plants that are ready to harvest, others that we need to leave for a bit longer so the seed can further mature and dry. So it's gonna take several cuttings to gather as much seed as we need for next year's crop. So we'll come in and we'll notice the plants where the seed heads are beginning to dry down. Here's a good example here. Now we could come in and cut the seed heads individually, but oftentimes it's more efficient to just come in and cut the entire plant like this. And we'll gather together several of these that are mature. Nope, here's another one over here. Well, maybe that one's not quite ready. Here's one down here that is. Here's some down here that's ready. Here's a plant over here that has mature seed. Okay, so now we have a bunch of uh, uh, cilantro seed now that's ready to hang and dry. We'll bundle it together using a rubber band. I'll trim these stems off here. Okay, now we have a, a uh, bundle of cilantro uh, stems tied together. The uh, seed heads have not advanced to the point where they're going to be shattered or lost. And so we'll hang this to dry in a bright, airy area, out of the sun, out of wind. And we'll keep an eye. If we do start to see some shattering, we may need to place a tray below it. But my experience with cilantro is that it generally clings pretty well as it dries down. We'll let it dry down till all the seed are completely brown, and it'll be ready then for the next step which is to, to separate the seed from the stems and to winnow the seed. 
Several weeks have passed since we harvested our cilantro seed. We gathered the stems together and we hung the bunches of stems up to dry in a cool place that was very airy. The uh, stems have dried down completely and the seed is now ready to separate from the stems. Part of the process of dry harvesting seeds is to separate the seeds from the stems. On a large scale, this can be done by placing entire stems in a paper bag and, and crushing the bag or otherwise agitating it so that the seeds separate from the stems. On a smaller scale, this can be done by hand, which is what we're going to do today. We're just basically removing the, the seeds from the uh, cilantro seed heads and we'll work our way down through all of these seed heads pulling the seed off. The seed is relatively clean but we'll also do what's called winnowing where we'll separate the seed from the remainder of the uh, debris. Well, looks like we've got most of the seeds separated from the stems now. And as we can see here, the seed is pretty clean. There's still some stems mixed in, which will separate out through a process called winnowing. The process of winnowing uses natural air currents to move the lighter debris away from the heavier seed. Now where are the air currents going to come from? Well, sometimes you're lucky and there's a light breeze outside and you can take advantage of natural air currents. But more often you'll want to create just the right level of air movement to move the debris off the seed. And that can be done by gently blowing with small quantities of seed using your breath, or it can be done using a fan as we're going to do here. The first step is to place the unclean seeds into a, a deeper container. And we have the seed here ready to go. We can still pick out a little bit more of that debris by hand. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and turn on our fan here to generate an air current. Now, a little trial and error may be, may be in, in, uh, uh, useful to help figure out where you should be relative to the air currents, because too much, uh, too strong of an air current, then you'll blow your seeds away. Too light of an air current, and the debris will stay with the seeds. But typically, the seeds are the heaviest part of the mixture, so let's see how this is going to work. Oh, it's working nicely. We can see how the, uh, the wind current, the air current, is blowing the debris away from the seeds. And you want to let the seed fall from, from some height so that you have good exposure of the uh, debris to the air currents. Okay. Already we can see that our seed is cleaner. Now we'll repeat the process. And again, you can raise the seed up a little bit higher to expose the uh, debris to more air movement to help move it away from the seeds. seeds are even cleaner. We're getting closer to where we want to be. So let's go ahead and repeat again. We can see the seed is nearly, nearly clean. And let's do it one more time. Looks like we have one clump of debris here that we can pick out by hand. The seed's looking good. A few more small stems that we'll pull out. I think one more time should do it. All 
right, and here we have the, uh, the uh, clean seed ready to be packaged for storage. Well, we have our cleaned cilantro seed here now. The next step is to put it up for storage. And if properly handled, a seed can oftentimes last several years, but it has to be properly handled. So we've gone through a lot of effort to, to collect the plants. We've hanged them up to dry. We've separated the seed from the debris. We have the clean seed. What do we do next? Well, we're going to place the seed into airtight containers. We'll label those containers, and then we'll put them up into refrigerated storage. And here's the process. I like to pour my seeds over a cookie sheet or a container so that if I lose some seed, I can easily regather it. So we'll place the seed inside this small container. And a little bit more, it looks like, will fit. Maybe just a little bit more. Okay, so now we have the uh, seed inside the container, and we'll go ahead and put the airtight lid on. So there's the seed. Now, the only the final step is to label the seed so we remember what it is and when we collected it. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Cilantro. And seven, 25. 2020. And now here is our seed ready to be put up into storage. Okay, well, do we have any questions at this point, Anna, about uh, seed saving or just the basic process of, of how seeds are developed? Not right now. <laughs> uh, people were asking about some additional links that I put in the chat. So just want to say that's also a very acceptable thing. Uh, we're happy to share the videos we've already done in the past uh, if you just ask us, but no, uh, no other questions right now. Okay, very good. Well, let's jump back to the presentation. <clears throat> okay. Now, of course, um, we can also obtain seeds in ways other than saving seed. And there are lots of reputable sources available where a person can purchase seed. Now, if you're a commercial scale farmer, there are nurseries that, that cater to, to your needs. They will have a wide range of seeds, oftentimes in larger size packages than are typical for home gardeners. If you are a home gardener, there's, there's lots of sources there as well. Now, there are some basic things that you should look for if you're purchasing seed. And the first thing, of course, is you know, try to find a source that's, that's reputable, that you've had experience with, or that's been recommended to you. Secondly, according to uh, Missouri, uh, uh, Missouri Department of Agriculture seed legislation, all seeds sold in Missouri must be free from weed, seed, chaff, and impurities. And typically there'll be some information on the, uh, the uh, packaging of the seed or perhaps in the uh, nursery catalog that's describing the seed that will tell us that. <clears throat> the seeds should also be fresh. And somewhere on the uh, packaging, there'll be a, a, uh, a date. All seed packages must be dated in Missouri. And the date that is on it is the date, the year in which the seed was collected. And uh, typically that will be either on the label on the front or sometimes it's along the flap on the back of the package. And then good quality seed will have information as far as its germination testing. And if we look at this particular um, package of, uh, of uh, pak choy, we'll notice that it was germination tested on 1115 and it germinated 99%. So again, that's, that's pretty good. That's, you know, that's, that's what you would hope from a standpoint of a of a packet of seed. And this particular packet of seed was packaged for a sale in 2015. Okay, so as far as seed storage, it's a good practice, especially if you're a commercial scale farmer, to focus on current season's production with your seed purchases. But as we've seen in the past two years, sometimes 
seed supplies are, our seeds are in short supply. And there can be an advantage to purchasing more than one year's worth of seed. Perhaps there's a price break, or perhaps it's just a question of availability. And um, if that's the case, then it's very important to store that extra seed carefully. Our goal here is to maintain what's called seed viability. And seed viability is just a way of saying that that seed will germinate and grow into a plant after a period of time. Now, the best storage conditions for seeds are first of all, cool, secondly, dark, and third, protected from moisture. Now, on a commercial scale, nurseries have large, large uh, volume uh, coolers that are very carefully temperature controlled and humidity controlled where their seed is stored. At home, we can also achieve this same approach by taking seeds, putting them into an airtight container. It could be something like we see on these pill bottles here, or it could perhaps be a glass mason jar that has a sealed lid. This is a good way to hold seeds in packages. It could also be done in Ziploc heavy duty plastic bags. And then these seeds are placed under refrigeration. Typically they're stored in the refrigerator, although for long-term storage, some gardeners will store their seed in, uh, in a freezer. And then it's very important again to protect them from moisture, hence the uh, need of a sealed type container. And Patrick, uh, I know you have a open question from someone asking about a lack of freezer space for sunflower, corn, bean seeds, et cetera. Uh, any creative solutions for that? And, and must the seeds always be kept cold? If your goal is to maintain viability, yes, they must be kept cold. Uh, if you hold seeds at room temperature, many seeds will very quickly lose their ability to, to sprout and grow. So uh, having a, a, a storage place with, with cool temperatures is, is very important. Now, if you're a, a bit of a, of a fanatic like me, you'll actually purchase an extra refrigerator to put your seeds in, which I've done. But if, if, you, if you look around, you can oftentimes find small refrigerators. These might be apartment sized refrigerators or even the, uh, the very small ones that are used in dormitories and that sort of a setting. And those make excellent, excellent places to store seed. So keep your eyes out, go to places like Habitat for Humanity or, or to these, these online sales platforms and look for a small refrigerator. That's the perfect place to store seeds. Do we have any other questions, Anna? Nope, that is about it. Okay, let's talk about uh, viability and what we can expect from our seeds. And again, different types of vegetables have different lengths of time that the seed remains viable. Some types of vegetables have a very short lifespan, you know, perhaps just one year of viability, and you'll want to purchase fresh seed every year or save seed every year. And this includes things like onions, parsnips, parsley, salsify, and spinach. Other types of seeds may, may last two years, corn, peas, beans, chives, okra, and dandelions. Three years, some of the, the more longer lived seeds, carrots, leeks, asparagus, turnips, and rutabagas. Uh, we can expect four years from peppers, chard, pumpkin, squash, watermelons, and basil. And there are some vegetable seeds that will last a long time in, in the proper storage. And this includes most brassicas, which would be things like broccoli, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, beets, tomatoes, eggplant, cucumbers, muskmelon, celery, lettuce, endive, and chicory. So again, having an understanding of what to expect is helpful too. And if we have, for example, if we're purchasing onion seed, it just doesn't make sense to buy years in advance on onion seed because the seed just won't last. It doesn't have a long uh, lifespan. Whereas something like, uh, you know, if you get a really good deal on tomato seed, yeah, we can buy that ahead because we can expect five years of, of life from that seed under proper storage conditions. Now, let's say that we've had some seed in the refrigerator for several years, and we're wondering what level of viability to expect from that, and especially if we're getting close to the, uh, the expected lifespan of that seed. Well, we can very easily perform a viability test. And this is where we take a known number of seeds. I typically use a 25 count of seeds, 25 seeds, place them between moist paper towels, and then put that package into a Ziploc plastic bag. I generally use a gallon sized bag. And then zip it shut and put it in a warm area. And generally within about three to five days, germination, if it's going to occur, will take place. And at that point, I pull the uh, Moist paper towel is out of the bag, I unfold it and I take a look at the seeds and I count the number of seeds where I can see evidence of germination. And as we see on these seeds here in the picture, 
what you'll see typically first is the very small root emerging from the seed. And if you've been a bit delayed in un unwrapping the packet, you may even see sprouts. But then you count the percentage of seeds that germinate, and this gives you a feel for, for how many of the seeds that you have on hand will actually sprout and grow into a plant. And this, for example, is useful information if you're uh, direct seeding. Let's say that you've got some radishes and only about 50% of those radish seeds are still viable. Well, I would, I would then take my, my seed and plant it twice as dense in the garden, recognizing that a good part of those radish seeds are just not going to sprout. Okay, now let's turn our attention to managing seed-borne diseases. And there are a number of plant diseases that can actually be spread on or in seeds. Uh, these, you know, this is particularly tricky because in many cases you can't visibly see evidence of infestation on the seeds. You know, uh, in, the, in the case of viruses, they're very tiny, you don't see them, and there may be diseases that are actually internal in the seed, and you can't see it from the outside, but it is still there, and then as the seeds germinate and begin to grow, the resulting plants will then show infection from these diseases. And in fact, this is a way frequently where new diseases arrive on a farm or in a garden, when a gardener unknowingly plants seed that is infested. Some of the common diseases that are spread this way include tomato bacterial canker, tomato septoria leaf spot, and that upper picture there of those tomato seedlings is septoria leaf spot, alternaria of crucifers, downy mildew of basil, and watermelon bacterial fruit blotch, which is what we see in the lower picture. And when we think about pest management or integrated pest management, one of the important, important tenets of IPM is to start with clean stock. And so we wanna start with clean seeds whenever possible. And if there is a risk that the seeds may be contaminated with diseases, then we need to think about what we can do to clean those seeds up. Now, commercial nurseries frequently will test seeds that are prone to seed-borne diseases. You know, for example, those uh, watermelons that we saw in the previous slide that had uh, blotch, well, a, a reputable nursery is going to take a few seeds from each lot of, of uh, watermelon seeds, plant them, grow them out, and make sure that they're not infested with blotch. Blotch shows up pretty quickly on the foliage, and you can, you can tell then that those seeds were contaminated. Uh, commercial nurseries will also expose their seeds to treatments that eliminate seed-borne pathogens. And some of the common treatments include hot water treatments, and then also exposing the seeds to hydrochloric acid, calcium hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, or peroxyacetic acid. And these are all pretty strong sanitizers, and they do a fairly good job of eliminating any microorganisms like pathogens that would be present on the seeds. Now, really, the only treatment that, that takes care of internal issues would be hot water treatments. Now, what can we do on the farm or in the garden? Well, we, we can have practices in place as well. And particularly if we're saving seed, and we suspect that some of our saved seed might have issues, we can, we can do uh, practices to eliminate seed-borne pathogens uh, ourselves. And these are typically hot water treatments or chlorine bleach treatment. So let's take a closer look at both of these. So hot water treatment, uh, this is a multi-step process. First of all, we take the seeds and place them in a cheesecloth or a nylon bag, you know, something that is very porous that will allow the warm water to move freely around the seeds, but yet we'll keep the seeds confined. And cheesecloth or nylon bag works really well for this. And then we wanna start by warming the seeds. We soak it for 10 minutes in 100 degrees Fahrenheit water. This is just to get the process started. And then the important part of the process is the actual hot water treatment. Now it's very important that we hold the seed at the right temperature because if it gets too hot, it can kill the seeds. If the temperature is too low, it may not eliminate the pathogens. So we've got to be able to very carefully control the temperature of the water. We also need to be circulating that water, swirling it around so that it reaches all of the seeds in our mesh bags. Now, looking at this picture, I thought this was kind of an interesting approach. That um, instrument that is down there in the container of water is called a sous vide. And this is a, uh, an instrument that heats water and holds the temperature very uniformly also agitates the water. Uh, these types of, uh, of instruments are frequently used in, in cooking and in uh, making, making various types of dishes where you want to carefully control water temperature. And uh, I've been thinking about purchasing a, a sous vide to, to cook with, and 
Now I find that there is a way to purchase that and claim it as a farm expense on my taxes. But uh, at any rate, it's a very effective way to, to warm the water and to create the perfect hot water treatment for, for the different seeds. Uh, here's a table that gives us some representative temperatures and lengths of time that we need to expose the seeds to those temperatures. So if we pick a few of these out, let's say, uh, looking at the cilantro that we collected in the earlier video, we want to hold cilantro seed for 30 minutes at 127 degrees to eliminate pathogens. Um, looking at something like tomatoes, we hold tomatoes at 122 degrees for 25 minutes to see the, the desired effect as far as eliminating seed-borne pathogens. So use the, uh, the uh, figures that are available in these various tables to help guide the temperature and the duration for the hot water treatment. And again, remember, don't go any warmer because then you run the risk of killing the seeds. Once the hot water treatment is done, then take the seeds out of the hot water and quickly put them into a cold water bath for five minutes to stop the heating action. Then we take the seeds out of the, uh, the uh, cheesecloth or nylon bag and we spread them on clean paper towels or we can put them on screens. Uh, it's, a, it's a good practice to dry them fairly quickly. And looking at this picture, this is actually a food dehydrator that has a uh, room temperature setting. And this is the perfect place to dry seeds after a hot water treatment. Just spread them out on the racks, turn on the fan. Again, make sure that it's not heating, make sure that it's set on room temperature and let the, the uh, um, circulation of the air by the fan dry the seeds. Now, once the seeds have been dried, then they can be further treated with a fungicide or, or, or other practices. But typically, for, uh, for most purposes, the hot water treatment is sufficient. The other approach that we can take with seed-borne diseases is the chlorine bleach treatment. Keep in mind, this is not particularly helpful with, with uh, diseases that may be actually inside of the seeds, but it does take care of external bacteria and some viruses. So the, the process here is to take one quart of bleach and mix it with five quarts of potable water, drinking water quality water. We add a drop of detergent to this mixture, and then we add the uh, seed to the, uh, the solution. And again, this can be done with seeds in a, uh, a cheesecloth or a nylon mesh bag, and then we submerge them in the solution. We leave them in the solution for one minute, you know, agitating the solution so that it moves thoroughly around all of the seeds. Then we pull them out of the bleach solution, rinse them in cold potable water for five minutes to remove the, any, any traces of the disinfectant, and then spread the seeds out to dry as we just discussed. So either the hot water treatment or the chlorine bleach treatment can be very helpful in cleaning seeds up when they are infested with bacteria or, or viruses or fungi. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? Nope, you can go ahead. Thank you. Now, um, there are some seed treatments that are used to help uh, address issues that might come along a little bit later in the life of the, uh, the uh, vegetable. And there are a number of, of diseases and insects that can be found in the soil. Uh, some of these soil-borne diseases cause damping off, others cause other kinds of diseases that strike our vegetable plants. And then we could have insects like uh, cucumber beetles or wireworms um, that are found in the soil too that will attack the seeds and the germinating seedlings as they begin to grow. And so there are treatments that are dusted onto the seeds before the seeds are planted that will help control these problems. An example is, is the fungicide thyram, which targets soil-borne diseases. Now, typically, a uh, seed that has been treated with fungicides or insecticides is then dyed uh, a color. Usually it's a bright color so that the person who's working with that seed knows that it's been treated and doesn't then direct that seed into animal food or even to human food because the uh, uh, fungicides or insecticides on the seed would be toxic. Keep in mind that most of these treatments are not organic treatments. There are a few fungicides and insecticides that are organic that can be used as a seed treatment, but the majority are not organic. Now, um, we can do this at home as well. Although typically, if we're going to be using disease and insect treatments, the, this will be done by the nursery, but it can be done at home as well. If you have a particular insecticide or fungicide that is labeled for this purpose, you place a small quantity of the, the pesticide into a sealed container and place the seeds in there as well, and then shake it until the seeds are completely coated.
Another seed treatment is pelleted seed. And this is a very common treatment that is used for uh, uh, commercial seeds. If we look at this picture here, we can see carrot seed and we can see pelleted carrot seed. And frequently in uh, commercial scale uh, farms, seeds are planted with mechanical seeders. And these mechanical seeders are much more effective if all of the seed is very uniform in shape and size. So for example, if we were planting something like corn, that's pretty straightforward because all corn kernels are about the same size. But if we look at this carrot seed, so there's different sizes in, in there and they, they are along, they're not uniform in shape. And in fact, some of them are elongated, some of them are smaller and rounded. This would not be a good candidate for a mechanical seeder. But if we take each of those carrot seeds and embed it in something like, uh, as we see here, that all of a sudden turns the irregular seed into a very regularly shaped pellet, now we can use that seed in a mechanical transplant. And so the material that is placed around the seeds is typically a type of clay. And the result again, as we see in this picture, is a uniform sized pellet. Now, this pellet material is, is pretty stable as long as the seeds are kept dry. Now, as soon as the seeds are planted, in most cases, the pelleting splits away and allows the seed to, uh, to then germinate and grow. Now, you wanna be sure that you keep pelleted seeds dry because if they do get wet, then the pelleting will then begin to flake off of the seeds. Now, um, there's both conventional, conventional and organic pelleting. You know, there are uh, organically approved materials for coating pelleted seeds. And some seeds that are commonly pelleted include carrot, onions, and, and various types of herbs. Now, it's difficult to do a good job of pelleting seeds at home. This is typically a process that, that a nursery will do, again, to make the seed easier to use in a mechanical seeder. And we also have multi-pelleted seed, where we have pellets with, with more than one seed within them. I didn't have a good picture of that, but it would be similar to what you see here, but there would be several seeds in each pellet. And this is commonly used with uh, uh, onion seeds. Frequently, we're growing onions as a, a scallion or a bunching green onion. And in that case, several onion seeds are placed in each pellet. And then when that pellet is planted, typically two or three onion plants will grow, giving us the desired uh, bunch of uh, small onion plants. Prime seed. So with prime seed, there's two approaches. And priming basically is taking seed and starting the germination process within the seed and then stopping it before the seed actually begins to grow. So in other words, we're kind of shortening that period of time from when the seed is planted to when it actually germinates and grows into a seedling. And there's two approaches. Uh, one approach is, is to expose the seeds to what are called osmopriming compounds. And these are typically compounds such as uh, polyethylene, glycol, and other types of materials that will penetrate the seed and start the germination process. A more natural approach is to actually expose the seeds to just enough water to dissolve these germination inhibitors and to start early germination stages, and then to dry the seeds out. Either way is, is successful. If we do this at home, typically the approach that we do is the, uh, the use of water. So prime seed is gonna germinate faster and it's gonna germinate more uniformly. There is a trade-off. Prime seed typically has a shorter period of viability. You know, we've started the germination process and this shortens the length of time that that embryo can then survive without actually germinating and growing. And frequently priming is done in conjunction with pelleting. So you can purchase seed that has been both, both primed and pelleted. Now, priming is particularly useful when we have uh, seeds that we're trying to germinate at difficult times. You know, for example, Lettuce is a cool season crop, and lettuce germinates just fine when the soil is cool. But if the soil is warm, the uh, germination is much more erratic. And so if we're going to grow lettuce during the warmer part of the growing season, in late spring or summer, for example, it's a good practice to purchase primed lettuce seed because it will germinate more quickly and more uniformly when the soil germination conditions are not as favorable. And then we have what's called detailing. And some types of seeds just in their natural form have fuzzy coats or they might have appendages or, or other parts that, that interfere with mechanical planting. And one example is tomato seeds. Tomato seeds, as they're collected from the tomato fruit, have a very fuzzy appearance. If you were to look at a tomato seed under a microscope, 
it would look a bit like a, a hedgehog. It's that fuzzy. And the uh, fuzziness on these seeds, they, they tend to clump together and stick together. It's almost like Velcro in some ways. And so with detailing, these fuzzy coats are actually removed. In the case of tomatoes, the seeds are rubbed with, with uh, very fine abrasives in, in a tumbler, and that removes the fuzzy coats. A similar approach would be, would be used with seeds that have barbs on them or something else that would interfere with mechanical planting. And then once the uh, seeds have been detailed, they're much easier to work with from the standpoint of mechanical planting. Okay, do we have any questions at this point? No, you may continue. Now let's turn our attention to biological seed treatments. And there's a number of different ways that seeds are treated with biological agents. These are, are typically living organisms. An example here would be biological seed treatment with uh, Bacillus subtilis or Streptomyces or Trichoderma or a glioclatium. And these are all organisms that in some situations actually enhance seedling growth and survival. Many of these organisms are naturally found in the soil and they form uh, uh, a, an association with the germinating seedlings that helps support the growth of the seedlings. In some cases, they help make nutrients available to the uh, seedlings. And in other cases, they can actually ward off soil-borne diseases. And so again, it's a very natural way to uh, to, to help with seedling germination and growth. Now, sometimes we see inconsistent results from the use of these biological seed treatments. First of all, these are living organisms, and if they haven't been handled properly before they get to you in their package, there's the possibility that some of these organisms will have died in the package. And then the other issue is that the soils in which they are planted may or may not support the growth of these organisms. So in some cases, we get better results than in other cases. So again, this inconsistency can be a bit of a problem. But even, even that being said, there is some benefit to using biological seed treatments. And in many cases, they are approved by organic certifiers. <clears throat> Another type of biological seed treatment is inoculation seed treatment. And this is useful for a group of plants called legumes. And legumes are plants that can naturally harvest nitrogen in the atmosphere and then through an association with the bacteria, actually make that nitrogen available for their growth and also the growth of neighboring plants. And if we look at this picture here, those uh, swollen areas, those enlarged areas that we see on this plant's roots are those nodules. The nodules is where, it, where the, uh, the uh, movement of nitrogen takes place. And within these nodules, there are colonies of bacteria living. This is actually a, uh, a stem and, and root system from white clover. And these nodules are where the nitrification process, the nitrogen fixation process takes place. Now, oftentimes the uh, rhizobia bacteria and other bacteria that mediate nitrogen fixation are naturally present in the soil, but in some cases they are not. And we can actually see a benefit in the growth of legume vegetable plants by inoculating the seeds with the bacteria. Now, there are a number of different strains of rhizobia available. We have to match the right strain the right vegetable. You know, for example, a strain that might work with garden peas might not work with, with uh, green beans or some other legume. So it's important to match the specific strain to the specific seed, the specific vegetable seed. The uh, inoculants are available as solid liquids or freeze-dried. Typically what we see are, are uh, solid forms with, that are dissolved in water and then the legume seeds are dipped into the, the uh, a suspension of rhizobium, which coats the seeds, and then the seeds are planted. <clears throat> now, the inoculant, this is a living organism. So again, it has to be handled carefully. Make sure that you purchase a fresh supply and make sure that, that any, any that is left after you've used it is stored under cool and dark conditions. And keep in mind that if you have seeds that are previously treated with, with uh, uh, fungicides or, or insecticides, that treatment may actually kill beneficial bacteria that is found in the inoculants. So typically inoculants are used with untreated seeds. Here is an example of, a, of an inoculant that is specific for peas, vetch, and lentils. Now the final thing I wanted to talk about this evening is organic seed and seed treatment. Now organic seed is certainly available for purchase. 
and organic seed is seed that is collected from plants that are grown, grown under organic production practices. Uh, you, you can't harvest seed from, from uh, genetically modified crops or from uh, crops that were treated with conventional pesticides or conventional fertilizers and call them organic. So again, organic seed comes from organically grown plants. And generally it is considered to be what's called raw seed, no treatments present. Now, some treatments are actually allowed by organic certifiers, but be sure that you check with your certifier before treating the seed. So for example, if you want to use a, a chlorine-based treatment to, to take care of any pathogens that might be present on the seeds, make sure that you check with your certifier before doing this. And if you plan to use a, a biological seed treatment, check with your certifier about that as well. If you plan to purchase pelleted seed, or pelleted prime seed, again, check with your certifier to make sure that the material used in the pelleting is approved. Typically, water treatments are allowed, uh, some sanitizing treatments are allowed, and some biological treatments are allowed. So there are options for organic farmers uh, to use various types of, uh, of seed treatments as needed. So here are a number of resources that uh, gardeners and farmers can consult relative to seeds and seed treatments. And the first two in particular are helpful from the standpoint of treating seeds for pathogens that might be present on the seeds. The third resource is a general guide to uh, seed treatments. And then the uh, uh, final, treat, uh, final uh, resource is a guide to organic seed treatments and coatings. So again, these are, these are useful resources. I encourage you to check them out. I do we have four grafting workshops coming up. The first is on March 10th in Mountain Grove from 1 o'clock to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The second, Springfield on March 11th, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the evening. And then we have two workshops in Kansas City, both on March 12th, one from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock and one from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. The charge for the workshop is $30, which includes all supplies, two rootstocks, and scion and there'll be the opportunity to purchase additional rootstocks if desired. Further information on the workshop or uh, registration information is found at the link here on the, uh, the slide. And please feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact information will be on the final slide of the uh, presentation. I'm sorry, I forgot that there was actually a recording associated with that previous slide, but I did wanna highlight the uh, grafting workshops that we have coming up. And uh, here in, in Southwest Missouri, we'll have two workshops in Mountain Grove and Springfield, and then two workshops in the Kansas City area. So if you'd like more information, please reach out and, and I can, can share that with you. So at this point, that concludes our prepared material for our presentation on seeds and seed treatments. And if there are any questions, I'd love to tackle them at this point. I have no open questions, but um... You know, this is the last opportunity if anyone does. But that was great. And thank you for being so available. And um, I know you do have, I, I was happy to hear that you do have so much seed saving experience and you've been doing it for so long. So oh, I'm, I'm a bit crazy about that. <laughs> I, I just recently moved to a new farm and, and had to empty a freezer and, and about a third of what was in that freezer were my, my saved seeds. And so I was very careful to move those and move them successfully. Oh, very good. Um, we do have one quick question asking if the same applies to flowers. But I yes, yes, the, the same, the same uh, discussion points apply to flower seeds as they do to vegetable seeds. And uh, there are some uh, uh, flower seeds, for example, that are notorious for carrying seedborne diseases, and it's a good practice to treat those. Um, you know, with the hot water treatment. And there's guidelines out there as far as the right temperature and the, the right length of time for the hot water treatment to help with those flower seeds. But yes, the, the, the same concepts apply to flower seeds. All right, thank you. I think that's all that we have right now. Um, and just a reminder, because a lot of the chat came in regarding the uh, recordings on YouTube, and I do encourage you to check out our agricultural workshops playlist. There are already over 50, I believe, um, really wonderful workshops that we've already conducted that are there for you to use as you will. And 
the recordings from this week should be up by tomorrow evening. So you can check back there or feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions about that. Okay, well, are there any final questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, well, very good. I'll, I'll, I'll wish everyone a good night and look forward to seeing you at our next online workshop. Thank you.